ought to shout amen. Amen. Thank God for his blessing. Listen, you're breathing his air this morning. Amen. You're sitting on his pews this morning. You drove his car to church today. It ain't yours. Amen. Listen, you burned his gas today. And we ought to thank God for it. We were able to be in the house of God uh, this morning. Just shout the victory for the Lord. Amen. God has been good. Listen, if you're living and breathing today, you've been blessed. For that one is laid in the hospital bed today. He's still alive and breathing. He has been blessed. For that one in the prison today. Listen, if he's living and breathing, he has still been blessed today. There's no question about it. And I thank God for his mighty blessings on us this morning. Appreciate you being here today. Listen, we're going to take a time of prayer around the altar just like we always do. And so if you want to come pray for a few minutes this morning, come gather in the altar while our choir is coming down today. And we'll take a time of prayer. Father, we love you today. And God, we are so thankful, God, for your good grace this morning. And Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord, this week, how you have kept us, uh, Lord, in every way. You have protected us this week. And God, we give you the glory for everything that's taken place. The Bible is clear that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And so, God, if it's been good, Lord, it's been of you, and we know that. As a father today, we give you praise for that, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house. God, once again this morning, Lord, to be able to share the gospel. And, Father, we pray, God, you'd help us to preach as a dying man to a dying people today. Help us to worship you in this place today, to serve you, uh, Lord, in this place today. God, help us to fall down around this altar, God, and beg for the power and unction of the Holy Ghost. God, to help us through another day. And, Father, touch that one, Lord, that needs that touch from above today. Lord, it may be going through trying times, sickness, troubles, trials. Lord, maybe family problems, maybe children, maybe mom and dad uh, this morning. God, whatever it is, Father, I beg you to help them, bless them, strengthen them, and draw them to you today. God, you said we're drawn out of you. You're drawn out of us. And, Father, we want to show just to scooch up next to you. Uh, Lord, today, God, we want to feel your presence in this place. Uh, Lord, today, God, through everything that takes place, God, help us and use us. Touch those families that have lost loved ones and fill that void in their life. Uh, Lord, today, families with sick ones in the hospitals, wherever they may be, God, help them and touch them, lift them up, save the lost today. And God, I pray, Lord, you'd stir up the Christian heart today. God, we may be stirred about the things of God, the work of God, the ministry of God. And God, we'd get up and, Lord, do something about those things, Lord, to help the ministry of God here on this earth. God, we realize you don't need any help. God, you can do it all yourself. But you told us, Lord, to occupy until you come. And, Lord, that means to be busy about the Father's business. So, Father, I pray that you'd help us in that very thing this morning. Bless all the singing, uh, Lord, the rest of the morning, the preaching of the Word of God today. God, I pray, Lord, you'd put your hand upon it, your voice upon it. God, put your good spirit upon it this morning. God, that it may not fall on deaf ears today, but God, you'd use us in a mighty way that you'd be magnified and glorified through it all. Now, Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you've done. And God, right now, for what you're going to do this morning, we praise you for it already. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, Well, it is good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. We appreciate you being here uh, today. And thank God for if you're visiting us today, we appreciate you being in the house of the Lord uh, this morning. We have several families that are out today due to sickness and traveling uh, and those kind of things. Pray for them today that they'll get back safely uh, to us once again. We do appreciate the Sunday school hour uh, this morning and thank God for that. And Brother Cruz, I sure did appreciate that opening uh, this morning. Man, I I jotted that scripture down there. Just I made a note of it uh, this morning. It, I just it, God just took my my mind in a whole different direction with that, and so I appreciate that opening this morning. That was very meaningful, uh, and we thank God for that. But we appreciate what the Lord has done this week, and don't you appreciate the Lord getting you back to the house of God today? I mean, you could have been laying at home or laying up in a hospital bed somewhere today, not being able to be here. But I thank God He let us be here one more time this morning. And uh, don't forget several things. Thank you, Brother Cliff, Miss Amy, and all those that worked the food pantry yesterday. Uh, we appreciate that. And I guess you've probably seen the video and the word that Brother Cliff didn't put out. They were down at a, a food line. Food line donated a whole cart of food yesterday uh, to give away at the food giveaway. And so we thank God for that and what he's doing in the midst of that. I thank you all for helping out 
uh, and doing that. And don't forget the men's retreat coming up on May the 18th through the 20th. Uh, men, like, like I said, if you cannot come and be with us and stay at night, we still want you to come in the afternoons to the meals and to the devotion time. And uh, listen, God's going to stir our heart through that. And so please make, listen, go ahead and set your time aside now uh, to come and be with us and fellowship with us and have a good time. All these young men, we plan a lot of young men being there with us that uh, weekend. And just, uh, just uh, we're going to pour into them. And guess what? They're going to pour into us while we're there. And so we thank the Lord for that. So don't forget those things. If you have not turned your survey in yet, I am still looking for those. If you're still praying over it, then keep praying. Amen. <laughs> and uh, if you're like me, listen, I, had, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I've been kidding Miss Ashley about this. I'm always picking on her, and i got to stop. Amen. She's going she's gonna to vote me out. She, said, she reminds me every now and then. She said, I do have a vote in this church now, just so you know. <laughs> Amen. And I told her she'd be standing alone. But I'm just kidding, Miss <laughs> Ashley. I'm just kidding. But I've been kidding her about it. Every time I preach another sermon, she said something, and I didn't hear it. Every time I preach another sermon, she goes back, marks out one, and just changes the number on it. Amen? But I'm just picking at her. But if you've not done it, I had another church yesterday. Listen, another church yesterday asked me, could they do this survey? They asked me if I'd bring this and drop it off to them and asked me if they could do it. And I said, help yourself, brother. I don't have no, no title to it or anything else. But listen, it's just something we came up with. And I said, it's working for our church. I think it's going to work for other churches. Uh, and there's some that's working. But turn them back in. We have already started to work on uh, the survey. And again, it's, it's encouraging to me. Uh, I may not be encouraged by the number, okay? But I am going to be encouraged by the number. I, I've said before, if it comes back at a 69, I'm going to be encouraged that we wasn't a 68. Hallelujah. But what's more encouraging to me is that our people have gotten very honest with themselves. That's what encourages me. Is that you've looked at it and said, I'd sure like to put a 10 on there, but I know I'm a 7. Amen. I, I, it's just like me looking in the mirror and Jane tells me all the time, she said, you're the best looking man I ever married. And I am. <laughs> just so you all know. How do you know that, preacher? I'm the only man she's ever been married to. Settled. Then I look in the mirror. She says, I'm a 10. I look in the mirror and said, don't take her word for it. What number yet, preacher? You worry about that. Amen. But listen, be honest about it. God's been good through it. God's going to be good through it. And God's going to use it. But if you got it, put it in the box in the back. Because right now we're tallying all the, all the things up on it. And it's going to be exciting. It's going to help us out as a church. I'm excited about seeing what it's going to do. And that, matter of fact, a couple of pastors I talked to, and then a guy said yesterday, can I please, he said, can I, can I ask you to, uh, if you, you'll let us use that? And I said, brother, help yourself. Uh, if it'll help you out, I want, it, I want it to help churches and people down the, uh, down the road. Okay, so don't forget that. Thank you for praying for Ashley and their family with the loss of her mom. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, her grandmother this week, we preached that funeral there yesterday. And uh, my mom, we lost my uncle, her baby brother. Uh, this week had his funeral on Friday night. Thank y'all for praying for them and praying for the family and appreciate what the Lord's done this week through all that. And so thank you for being in the house of God this morning. Any other announcements? I know there's a ladies meeting coming up next Friday night. Next Friday, next Friday night is a ladies meeting at six o'clock, right? Next, next Friday night at six o'clock, Friday night. And then next Sunday is Super Sunday for all the ladies. All right. Okay. A few men will help out with the Sunday school classes. These ladies teach. Come see Jane, and she'll give you a position to work next Sunday, which will be good, and uh, they can they can help you with that, Miss Terrellian. The first twelve verses in the Old Testament. They got to learn all that. Man. How many weeks are you going to give them? You do realize there's people in here that been, been saved 20 years don't know 12 verses in the Old Testament. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Amen. Just kidding. Amen. But hallelujah. Give them a chance to work on that. Any other announcements today? All right. I'm sorry, Brother Mark. You have something, brother? Somebody had a birthday two days ago. That rat, you will throw him out of the house now, won't you, Miss? Miss Sue, amen. Amen. Come on up, Miss Sue. We'll sing happy birthday. Who else had a birthday this week or an anniversary this week? Huh? Who? Who? 
Somebody has a birthday tomorrow in the back. Who's in the back has a birthday tomorrow? Brother Gene. Brother Gene. I don't even see him back there. He done left the buildings. He done left the buildings. All right. We'll, uh, we'll get it. We'll, all right. Come on up here, Brother Gene. You better be glad he's old as he was. Don't he be dead? <laughs> Amen. Thank God. How old are you, Brother Gene? <laughs> Truthful. When you only was last year, I'm not going to ask Miss Sue. I never ask a lady her age. Amen. Amen. Any anniversaries this week? Any at all? All right, let's all stand and sing happy birthday to these right here today. Miss Terry Lynn, you and Miss Nicole are going to sing one this morning, I understand. Y'all come on up and get ready. Ushers, you come on up today. And uh, while you're taking the offering today, I'm going to let them sing. And so if we can get our ushers up here today, we'll do that. And they can sing a song for us today uh, while we're doing that, okay? Amen. Somebody found $20 in the basement floor this morning gave it to me and said, I don't know whose it is, and some rat took it before I got it to the offering plate. Amen. I'm just picking. Amen. They did give it to me. I found out whose it was, though. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and remember the offering this morning. And uh, Will, if you would, how about lead us in prayer, bud?
had this song pulled up here that I was playing earlier. Um, let me try to sing it for you. I can take a heart that's broken, make it over again. But I know a man who can. I can take a soul that's in sick. Make it whiter than snow, but I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, Redeemer of all men, but For he's my dearest friend. If you feel that no one loves you and your life is out of hand, will I know a man who can? I can't walk upon the waters or calm the troubled sea, but I know a man who can, and I can cause those blind eyes to open or make the lame to walk again. Oh, but I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men, but I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you feel no one can help you and your life is out of hand, Will I know a man who can? Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. Will I call him Jesus for he? My dearest friend, and if you feel like no one can help you and your life is out of hand, will I know a man who can? 
Yes, I know a man who can. Well, hallelujah, amen. I pray that you know him today. Thank you, Blake. I appreciate that, Miss Terry Lynn and uh, Miss Nicole. Uh, Blake, if, if you and uh, Miss Terry Lynn, Miss Nicole, and all y'all could raise enough money. Uh, to pay for your plane tickets and all, I sure would like y'all to have them go. Y'all, y'all go with me out to Texas uh, when I go, uh, Amen. And uh, I sure like to have them out there with me, do some singing that whole week of revival. Would y'all like to go out to, out to Texas, Amen? And uh, raise your money, get you a ticket. I say, let's go, Amen. We're gonna have a good time while we're out there. Let me just say this uh, in a way of another announcement tonight. Uh, Jane and I were talking about this. Uh, this morning, and Lord just, I don't know, he spurred my mind about it this week, and again the, this morning, uh, Wednesday night, Jane had showed the uh, youth a video on Wednesday night of a missionary, it's a missionary video we watched years ago, uh, back from the early 90s, somewhere uh, in there, and how many young people in here to, today that saw that Wednesday night, amen, very touching video, uh, and tonight, uh we, I think we'll be able to get everybody in there. We'll see. Uh, but tonight, we're going to try uh, to be in the old auditorium tonight uh, to watch that video. Amen. Uh, I got a few things I'm going to say. Also tonight, we're going to have a special prayer uh, over Brother Worley and Miss Angie tonight. They have called and asked for special prayer. They're not here this morning uh, because she got an emergency call from the hospital this morning. And they had to go and do part of her job. Uh, there at the hospital, and he didn't know if they was going to make it to the service or not, but he said they'd be here tonight. But they've called and asked for special prayer. Uh, two weeks from today, they're going back into the church at Lincolnton, and they're going to be there for a while uh, trying to help that church, and they want prayer. They know they need prayer, and he's asked the church to pray over them tonight. So tonight, we'll be praying over them, uh, and also, we're going to try to go in there and show that video. I, I would like for the church to be stirred by that. I've watched it numerous times over the years. You will love it. And we want to do a little something different and be over there uh, tonight. Brother Joy, I don't know if we can hook that video to nothing back here and show it on both these TVs, can we? It's on an old VHS. And so, but he's going to look at it and see. But we're going to try to squeeze everybody in there. Wouldn't it be, luck, wouldn't it be nice to have enough people back tonight we couldn't get in that building over there? Hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, but we're going to try that tonight if we can uh, to show that. Just to give you something different here, and I'm going to comment on a few things. Uh, and try to help you out with that. Matthew chapter number 3 uh, this morning. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter number 3. I'm going to read about the first um, 11 verses uh, somewhere in there. And uh, let me just put it this way before I start preaching this morning. It's kind of like the uh, riding an airplane. Go ahead and buckle up. Uh, amen. Uh, before we get started this morning, God's really impressed upon my heart this week. Uh, this particular message. Uh, and so you buckle up. But you may be like a buddy of mine. He was flying with me into Puerto Rico years ago on a mission trip. And uh, we've, uh, we've had a, several rocky landings uh, here and there going into different places. And you, you're kind of wondering, man, I, I know if we land in here, can we get out of here? And so we were going into Puerto Rico. And we were all sitting around laughing, talking, carrying on a bunch of us guys on, on a uh, mission trip. And that plane got real rocky going into the landing. He grabbed a hold of his seat. And I looked at him. He was he was white as a sheet of paper, I'm telling you. He was latched onto that seat, and he had done turned white as he could be, and he was holding on, and we were was, we was still just cutting up and carrying on, and we wouldn't buckle up. He said, buckle up. He said, buckle up. He said, y'all need to buckle up. I said, for what? What good is that seatbelt going to do me if that plane crashes? Amen. <laughs> amen. So I'm telling you to buckle up, but if the plane crashes, amen, I can't help you in that part. Amen. We're going to do the best we can with what God's given us today. Uh, to preach to you, but I want to preach something to you that God's literally laid upon my heart. I have watched and I have listened, uh, and I don't get involved in uh, in vain babblings, and I don't get involved in uh, things on Facebook and those kind of things. I think as preachers, we ought to just preach the gospel, uh, preach where God called us to preach and do what God called us to do, uh, and do the work there. Uh, God didn't call me to do the work of an evangelist, because I'm not an evangelist, I'm a preacher, amen? And so uh, I, I begin to uh, look at a lot of things that's going on around the country with uh, whether they be revival meetings uh, or, or things like that or tent meetings and things going on. Uh, and God had drew my mind to this uh, many, 
several years ago, to be honest with you, God drew my mind to it, and I never preached on it. Uh, matter of fact, when my brother died, my brother died March of 29th, three years ago. It's the same, uh, uh, Beckett was born that very morning uh, that he died. Uh, and uh, when I preached my brother's funeral, I preached on this thought right here in this church. Ain't nobody knows Jesus like John. I came to my brother's funeral and here, and I preached. I'm going to tell you right now, my brother knew the Lord. There was no question about him knowing the Lord. His name was John. I called him Bug all his life. And somebody mentioned to me about John. I'm like, who are you talking about? Amen. They said, your brother. And so I came and preached on that thought. Ain't nobody knows Jesus like John, that's not the thought I'm going to preach to you today. I'm just, just trying to uh, give you a few thoughts here. But here in, in Matthew chapter number 3, we're dealing here with John the Baptist. And I want to share a few things with you here about John the Baptist today. And I want to relate it to modern day preaching and modern day church and what we have uh, this day and time. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. How many of y'all like to have John preaching for you? The average church today look at something like that and go, he ain't getting in my pulpit. Uh, amen. Ain't no way I'm giving him a shot at it. Amen. Look at him. Amen. Did God call him to preach? Amen. I mean, you sure? You know what you're talking about. Listen, John, John was a pretty rough guy here than I... Uh, studied him out. The Bible says in verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea. Listen, everybody wanted to hear John preach though. According to what I'm reading right here. The Bible says, Went out to him, all, him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Judea. Everybody wanted to hear John preach. I'd say he had made his mark on somebody uh, down through time, there's no question about it. And then he goes on to say in verse number 6, And were baptized of him in Jordan, doing what? Confessing their sins. Here we go again, Brother Chris. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all would have had to been in our Sunday school class this morning to know what I'm talking about there. Amen. Confessing their sin. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, uh, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, you bunch of snakes, no count, low down, sorry. Uh, amen. We can't use that terminology this day in time. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to a father. For I say unto you that God is able to eat, uh, of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. I want to preach to you just on this simple thought today, if you want to mark it down in your Bible. John, the Baptist preacher. John, the Baptist preacher. And by the way, he is the first preacher recorded in the New Testament in the Gospels here. And God's, listen, God's word recorded that he is John the Baptist. I want you to just record it today, John, the Baptist preacher. Now let me give you some things here. For over 400 years at this time, 
the nation of Israel had heard, not heard the voice of a prophet. For over 400 years, when John the Baptist came on the scene, listen, all the prophets were gone at this time, and they had not heard the voice of one man of God in 400 years. I'm going to be honest with you. There's been a many years in a lot of places right now since they have literally heard the voice of God. But 400 years they had not heard, Israel had not heard a prophet. They were used to the prophets. They had not heard a prophet up until that time. And we find here that God sends a Baptist preacher to start a revival through John the Baptist. You have to read the whole story and, and listen to the whole thing to realize what I'm talking about. There's several things we find out about John. When John came here on the scene, he came with a message that was centered on repentance and the kingdom of God. His main message, what John preached, was repentance and the kingdom of God. Amen. Number two, he came with authority. Amen. I think that every man that's called of God to preach the gospel comes with God's authority. Amen? That's according to the Word of God. God has laid His authority on the local church, and He comes with authority. He was fulfilling the prophecy given here in Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 3, where the Bible says, The voice of Him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. In other words, what are you saying? Hey, I need you to go. I'm sending you to go. I'm commanding you to go. To make straight, I am coming. There's a road that needs to be cleared, and I need you to clear the road. I'm on the way. He came with authority. He came with the baptism of repentance. Amen. There's a lot of people get baptized, don't ever repent. Amen. John came with the baptism of repentance. That you repent first. Amen. You don't get baptized and then go through some class to try to uh, get you saved. No, you repent first according to the Word of God. He came here with the baptism of repentance. One writer said it this way. He said, it prepared the nation for Christ and presented Christ to the nation. John's preaching. It prepared the nation for Christ and presented Christ to the nation. Can I tell you, I believe every born-again believer, every, every uh, Baptist preacher, Methodist preacher, Presbyterian preacher, Catholic preacher, put whatever name you want to on it. Listen, we've got a duty to do today, and that is to prepare the way for God, to pray, prepare the way for the Lord. In other words, we ought to be doing exactly what the writer said. We ought to prepare the nation for Christ and present Christ to the nation in all that we do. Number four here, we find that, also we find that, listen, there's something about John here. We know that if we read the script that the Jews were baptizing the Gentile converts, but John himself was baptizing Jews. Amen. Number four, we find here about John that he came with obedience. He had obedience. He was willing to follow Christ. He was willing to follow what Christ asked him to. To do. Matter of fact, if you read the story here about John here in verses 13 and 15, listen, he wanted to baptize the Lord, and, and John tried to stop him. John wanted to stop him from baptizing. And Jesus said, no, it's the will of the Father. I need you to be obedient, John, in this. My, 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 my. Would to God that we'd have some men of God to get real with God today. Listen, get obedient to God in preaching the Word of God. I am sick, and I pray that this hits Facebook and all of this listening. I'm not in their battle, but I am sick of preachers bashing other preachers and name calling on Facebook and and TV and everywhere else. And listen, I'm just I'm just calling. I'm I'm talking about ugly now, coming out of preachers. Amen. It is God that gives the authority to preach. It is God that sends preachers, and I pray that God's preachers would get obedient to the Word of God. Can I tell you this? I pray that churches would get obedient to the will of God and to the Word of God. 
Now, you got to remember, that's not talking about this building. This building, listen, it just houses the Christians that's in here. It is a sanctuary place where we meet for God, meet with God. And as we come together, listen, we're to worship Him and keep it a sanctuary. Hey, but I wish, listen, my goal today would be uh, uh, to have some preachers, the men of God, that are called to God to prepare the way for God to be busy about the Father's business. Uh, stop being busy about His business. I mean, it ain't none of my business what they're doing down the road today. My business is at New Life Baptist Church. That's where God called me to preach. And that's what God gave me the sermon for. Listen, God's got my business right here today. God's going to have my business here tonight. God's going to have my business here uh, for Wednesday night Bible study. And if I got time to get in somebody else's business this week, I got time to go knock some doors for New Life Baptist Church and stay busy about the Father's business. Would to God we'd get some men to be called and they'd go and serve and, and listen, they'd be messengers like John and Listen, I could throw Peter in here too, man. I, I love Peter. If there's anybody ever just risen up and, 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 and was a, 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 maybe a, 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 a cousin to Peter, it's me. I, I mean, I, I'm the one that, you listen, if you mess with my Lord, I ain't going to try to be nice to you. I just cut your head off. I mean, I missed your ear. I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand Peter cut his ear off. Amen. I, I might miss your ear and just cut your head off. Amen. I, I'm, I'm just one of them, amen. Listen, John John came here screaming in the, uh, in the wilderness. I begin to think about this over the last uh, few weeks and actually over the last uh, few months. And I, I begin to study and I begin to read and I begin to look at John's life and, and how John came on the scene here preaching the gospel. And listen, if there's one thing I believe that I would enjoy, uh, that would be having a ministry like John the Baptist. I really do. I, I, I would like to be called John the Baptist preacher. Amen. I pray that the other preachers would, have been, would want to be called John the Baptist preacher. Listen, I, I, I don't care uh, if the, the, the Methodists, we've, we've got too much stuff trying to cross lines now. Uh, anyway, they, they, they're so hung on their denomination and everything. I'm not hung up on the denomination. I want you to know that. That is not me. I've said probably in this pulpit a hundred times, you can have uh, what's on the sign. Now, John, I don't care. You just can't have what's in my heart. I'm independent by choice. I'm an independent Baptist by choice. Listen, that don't make me who I am. I'm saved, born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That makes me who I am today. Amen. God didn't call me because I was a Baptist. God called me, called, called me because he knew I'd have a willing heart. And listen, he formed me and made me what I am today. Listen, that's what I am by the grace of God. But I began to look at John's life and think about some things here about John that I wish we could insert in our churches today, especially our Baptist churches. And I can, I can tell you this, I can relate this to the church as much as I can a man of God today. When I began to look at it, I looked at several things. I want to try to show you three things here in John's life that I believe would be beneficial to any pastor and any local church, if we'll just read the Word of God and look at it. Number one, I begin to look at John's call. Can I tell you something about John's call today? I just read Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 3, uh, a while ago when I told you about it. It said, that's the voice of him that cried in the wilderness to prepare you the way of the Lord and make straight the desert uh, in the desert a highway uh, for God. Listen, God. listen, John's call was a direct message from God and a direct fulfillment of prophecy for God, for John to be used of God to preach the gospel. Matter of fact, turn with me, if you want to turn with me back a few pages, the book just before Matthew here, Malachi, Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3, and let's read verse number 1. Listen, it was a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of God that John be the preacher, amen? He says here in Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 1, he said, Behold, I will send you my messenger. Listen what he says again. And he shall prepare the way before me. Two times. Isaiah said the same thing. Malachi, he said the same thing. God says, I'm going to send you a messenger. And that messenger has got something to do. And that is to prepare the way of the Lord. Clear the road because I'm coming. Clear the road. Because I'm coming. Behold, I will send you my messenger, 
and he shall, pro he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, <clears throat> excuse me, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. What is he coming for? Listen, if you go back and study out some Middle Eastern stuff and study out the East uh, back in those days, and it's probably still that way in a lot of ways, uh, now you'll find out that they had a lot of rough places over there. There was a lot of rough roads over there. This was before highways and bridges. Listen, I've been in the Middle East over there, over in Israel over there, and we've been there. And listen, we you go into places even like uh, Nazareth. That, that's why, uh, who was it said, listen, can any good thing come out of uh, Nazareth? You wonder why that would take place. But Nazareth is actually hid down in between a bunch of mountains. You can't see it from anywhere at all unless you drive into it or you fly over it. You can't just see Nazareth from riding down the road. Amen. It couldn't be seen. How'd they get there? They, they had mountains all around that thing, all around that city, and they'd have to walk through the valleys, amen, or over the mountains uh, to get down in it. There was a lot of rough roads that had to be cleared to get into Nazareth and some of these other cities over there. The roads were very rough at that time. And listen, before a king would go in somewhere, if they said that the king was going to go here and visit or the king was going to go there and visit, there's some things that they had to go and clear the way. They had to clear the road. They had to clear some things out of the road. They had to make some things, uh, uh, prepare some things for the king to get where he had to go and where he desired to go. And when we look at this scripture right here and the prophecy that has been told here by Isaiah and by Malachi, it is the very exact thing that they were doing Back in those days when he said prepare the way, that it literally means go clear the road because I'm coming. Go clear the way. There's some things you got to get out of the way. As I begin to look at John here and study John's life and, and look at who he's preaching to and look at who he's uh, talking to and who he's dealing with, I begin to think and see some things here that John had to move to prepare the way for Jesus. And I believe that these are things that we're going to have to move in our life today and move in our local churches today to prepare the way for Jesus. Listen, John was dealing with the people that were very arrogant. Amen. They're the ones that said, hey, we are of our father Abraham. Amen. We're Jews. Amen. Uh, Brother Chris, we talked about the law uh, this morning. They, <clears throat> they had the law down pat. They had everything that they thought they needed. But when John went in there, there's some things that John had to clear out of the way because Jesus had told him, hey, prepare the way because I'm coming. And so John began to go in there and start preaching. And on that road, John had to move some things. Number one, John had to move some arrogancy out of the way. If there's one thing I believe we need to remove in a lot of our ba Baptist churches today, and I'm going to start with the pulpit, amen, then we'll go to the pew. If there's one thing we need to remove uh, out of our pulpits today and out of the way, is the arrogancy that has risen up in America in our churches. I've never seen such arrogancy in my entire life that people and pastors got so arrogant to think that they are somebody, they are above God, and now they have become pastor police, I guess. They feel like they got to shuck everybody's sheep, amen? They become pastor police uh, in America and some probably some places around the world. Listen, John had to remove some arrogancy that was going on in the land. John said, hey, don't, don't go and tell me that, listen, uh, that you, he said in verse number 9, and think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham as our father. We don't need him. We don't need the Lord. We don't need anybody else. We've got Abraham as our father. We don't need anything. God, John said, don't you even think about uh, talking about that. He said, listen, I got a God that'll come up in here and he'll, he'll raise up stones to Abraham's children in here. We've got a group of people, and we've got a group of Baptists and Methodists, and <clears throat> every name you can put on it today has risen up in arrogancy, and they think they have the title to it all. They've got it all figured out, amen? And they can go their own way and do their own thing. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother uh, uh, Worley will probably tell you this story, talking about the church he was at uh, last Sunday, got to talking about the people that, uh, were there, and one of the gentlemen said to him, he said, Preacher, our biggest problem is we got prideful. We got prideful, and we thought that it could never happen to us. I've probably said this a hundred times in this pulpit also. Don't think that it just happens down the road. Don't you think for one minute it won't happen here. 
as soon as, as soon as you and I get arrogant enough to think that we don't need God anymore, and we don't need preaching anymore, and we don't need the Bible anymore, and we don't need the Spirit of God anymore, and we don't need Bible study anymore. We've got it all figured out on our own. We can do it ourselves. We can handle it ourselves. Listen, you better mark it down, friend. There's some things going to have to be removed. If Jesus is going to show up, there's some things going to have to be moved along the way. And in our hearts, a lot of times, it's arrogancy, prejudice. These people were very prejudiced, amen? Uh, they, they believed in just themselves and nobody else. They were very prejudiced. Listen, prejudice is going to have to be removed out of our life. Can I tell you this? Tradition is going to have to be removed out of our life. John had to go in and remove tradition. Don't think they wasn't sitting that way. Amen. Let me just say this is that since I am a Baptist preacher, don't think for one minute that the Baptist is not sitting that way either. I just told my wife the other day, we were talking about some things. We are talking about, you know, everybody's talking about the Asbury Revival now. They're talking about different revivals going on. I ain't getting in the middle of their argument. Listen, can I tell you something about revival? I preached a message some years ago, been five, six years ago. I remember preaching this message right here. What happens when the last amen is said? That will tell you whether they have revival or not. You can't tell whether they have revival. You can't tell what God's doing. But I can tell you this, when God's finished, you can tell it's a finished work. Amen. What happens when the last amen is said? Then you can look at it and say, yea, it was revival, or nay, it was not revival. Amen. But listen, we get so arrogant, so prejudiced, we get so set in tradition all the time, we think that it's got to be our way all the time. We're just set in tradition. Uh, there's some men of God out there, they ain't going to change nothing. Now listen, I'm not changing the gospel. I ain't changing my Bible, just so you know. There's some things I'm going to stand on, amen. Listen, if I don't ever get to preach anywhere else, I'm going to stand on my Bible, amen. If, I, that, if God never opens another door, listen, I go to go to the back porch and preach, amen. I'm going to stand on my Bible. Listen, I, I just met Brother brother Chris. He texted me something the other day. We were talking about uh, churches closing down. He texted me a, uh, a little thing there about the Charlotte Observer and talking about uh, all these different churches. And listen, listen, to the world, church is becoming obsolete. It really is. And they're saying, listen, God's going to do away with the church. Let me look up here at me. That is not biblical. <laughs> God's not going to do away with the church. Church is going to be here until the Lord comes back. Amen. Listen, he founded the church, and nobody's going to destroy the church unless we destroy it ourselves within ourselves. But the church is going to be here when God comes back. It's a matter of who wants to be here in it. The church is who lives in us anyway. But the church is going to be here when God returns. There's no question about it. But they were set in tradition in their life. Jesus telling John, if you go read the story, listen, you need, you're need you going to have to clear out, clear the way of tradition here. Can I tell you this? If we want God to show up in our service, we want God to show up in our church, we're going to have to get rid of some, some, some tradition. It's always been done this way. It'll always be uh, done this way. My forefathers for 100 years have done it. I know, but the church is dying and nobody's getting saved and, and nothing has happened. Can I tell you today? that we are in a totally different generation than we were when your forefathers and my forefathers came along. Amen? That means it's going to take something different to reach them. Amen? We're going to still preach the gospel, but there's some things we've got to clear out of the way if we want Jesus to show up. There's some things as a church, as a local church, that we have to clear out of the way in order for Jesus to show up. Jesus said, hey, prepare your way. Go clear the road. There's some things you need to go tell them. There's some things you need to get rid of because I am coming. Think not think not. you can stay in tradition or uh, uh, be so arrogant. Hardness of heart. These people were, you're talking about a hardness of heart. The people that John dealt with were people that had a hard heart. Listen, the, the, the word of God fell on stony ground day after day after day. Can I tell you this? In our churches today, especially here in America and in our Baptist churches, because I is one. Listen, there's going to be a lot of gospel preached today, but it's going to fall on a hard heart and a stony heart today. It'll not change anything at all because of hardness of heart. Yesterday, I was preaching Miss Ashley's grandmother's funeral, and I had been asked to preach the gospel, and I never do a funeral without preaching the gospel. And I tell the people that come to me all the time, they may put me on a time limit, but that's not going to stop me from preaching the gospel. Amen. I think if you open your Bible and just read, you're going to preach the gospel. Amen. And so I always try to give them the gospel. Ashley has an aunt that's blind. 
And she was sitting on the very front row yesterday while I was preaching at the service. And I gave an invitation just like I always do at a funeral. That's not even politically correct anymore. I got chewed out last year for preaching the gospel at a funeral. I had a girl crawl all down my throat, caught, got all up in my face uh, after the funeral and just went ballistic on me in front of everybody. <laughs> Amen. I just keep praying for her. Amen. I mean, went ballistic. My, my wife was standing there. I thought my wife's going to crawl on me. I just looked at her and said, you done? Amen. You done? Yeah. They don't, they don't like the gospel. They don't like being told the truth. Amen. Listen, everybody in our families that when they die, they go to heaven now. That's a lie. Just so you know. I, this John the Baptist preacher is telling you that, just so you know. Y'all blame this on John. Everybody dies, don't go to heaven. Amen. Everyone says, Lord, Lord, not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Bible. That's Bible. Amen. But everybody dies, goes to heaven now. And so I was preaching yesterday, and I did mention a hardness of heart while I was in there. And Miss Ashley's aunt that's blind, sitting on the front row, Brother Gene. And I'm standing over here, doesn't give the invitation. I'm standing here, and bless her heart, she got up blind, trying to find the preacher. And I knew she was looking for me. She walked up front, she was looking around, trying to find the preacher. I walked around, put my arms around, and she said, Preacher, I know my heart's right with God. She said, But I heard you talk about hardness of heart. She said, would you please pray for my family? She said, my family's not right with God. She said, there's so much going on. And she just cried out to God. And we just prayed over her right there, prayed over her family right there at the funeral. Amen. Listen, we got to remove a hardness of heart. You want God to show up? You want Jesus to show up? The Bible says he's coming. Prepare you the way. Listen, if we want him to show up, God, listen, God told John, listen, I'm sending you down there for a purpose, amen. I'm sending you down there to clear the road because I'm coming. And those people have a hard heart. Now go tell them they have a hard heart. Oh, we can't tell people that this day and time. That's not politically correct to tell them anymore. They had a hardness of heart. Here's what most of them say. Hey, here's, here's what I find everywhere I go. I don't know about y'all, but. When it comes to witnessing and you talk, talk to somebody about the Lord and, and constantly just week after week you're mentioning in church and mention somebody about the Lord and try to, try to witness to them, 99% of the time I get one of these answers. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Pentecostal. Or I was baptized when I was four years old. That's 90% of my answers or more most of the time. Amen. And I have to look at them sometimes in a very nice way and say, I appreciate that, but that's not the question I asked you. I asked you if you were a born-again Christian. Or I asked you if you knew the Lord. Amen. Or you can even ask them if they're, hey, I said, listen, can I invite you to church? They said, well, I'm a Methodist. <laughs> Brother Sammy, I want to look at them sometimes. So I am too. We're at 6413 Burlington Road. Just to see if they'll show up. I mean, a man got to do what a man got to do. And they show up out there and go, that preacher lied. There's a, there's a Baptist church out here. Oh, now you're not going in because it's a Baptist church. Amen. So where's your heart in? Is your heart with the Methodists or is, is it with God? Amen. I had a, <laughs> matter of fact, <laughs> I had another invitation yes, uh, last week to go and preach at another church here in this county this year. But Jane's going, shaking her head now. Somebody asked me the other day, I just happened to be at a, a doctor's visit, and they said, Preacher, can I get you to come visit our church and preach with our, pe preach with our people this year? I said, You sure can. I am totally against a lot of the things they stand for. Y'all look at me, hear me out. Amen. But they asked me to come and preach. They didn't ask me what to preach <laughs> or what I was going to preach or anything else. And, Brother Gene, I accepted the invitation. I am just waiting on the phone call. I am going to have my set time. I am not a tree frog. I'm going to preach the same thing in, our church, in their church that I preach everywhere else. I don't care who's in there or what race they are. 
I'm going to preach. Amen? Why? Because it is about the gospel. It is not about the name that's over the door. It don't. Listen, we've got preachers out there so arrogant today. And listen, and listen, I deal with it all the time. Well, if you're going to preach over there for them, you won't never come preaching my Well, hallelujah, I'm glad you got the word out. Uh, don't think I'm going to call you and ask to preach anyway. If you don't call me, I won't be calling you. Amen? But God said we got to we got to remove some things. We need to remove some things out of our life. We need to remove some things out of the church. Listen, I believe at church, like anybody else's church, there are some things that we need to remove so that God can move in on the church. What's it going to take? Man, let's remove a hardness of heart. Self-righteousness. My goodness, don't get me started there. Self-righteousness. It's all about me. Amen. Give me that mirror and give me that cell phone and give me that selfie. Amen. It's all about me, and I'll post my pictures out there all day long and let you know who I listen. God said we got to remove it because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about God. But John came to prepare the way. If you look at the Word of God, in the salvation of the Lord, God uses people to preach and prepare hearts. For the Spirit. One writer put it this way. He said, God is ready to give the farmer a crop, but he must prepare the ground. God is ready to give the farmer a crop, but he must prepare the ground. Church, can I ask you something today? Do we want a full crop, half a crop, piece of crop? You know, what do, what do we want? We, we don't want a piece of crap. I probably shouldn't have said that. We want a <laughs> Now I got your attention, all you rednecks. Look up here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mama. <laughs> Jane is worried to death I'm going to get shot in Texas. <laughs> Just so y'all know, she's already worried. But anyway, listen, <laughs> I want a full crop. Amen? I want a full crop. For all y'all's visualists, I did that just for them. I mean, I'm just kidding. Listen, we want a full crop. Hey, hey, John's call. Listen, John's call. What was it? Prepare the way. I think as a pastor, I think as a local church, it's up to us to prepare the way for God. It's up to us to clean up some things, get some things out of the way, clear the road, clear the debris, get rid of it so Jesus can move in. Amen. I believe we'll get some things out of our heart. I think Christ will fill it with some things. Amen. I believe that he will. Not only that, I thought about John's cry. You listen to this right here now. Listen to this. John did not come singing. He didn't come healing. He didn't come offering deliverance. <laughs> he surely wasn't a some expository preacher. And for some of y'all that don't know what that word means, don't worry about it because I don't either. <laughs> I uh, listened to a man preach years ago, very, 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 very intelligent man. He taught in a great, 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 great Bible college, uh, very intelligent. He was always at this meeting I went to every year, and he literally got up, and he was teaching one morning, Brother Gene, and I'm sitting in there. I'm a young preacher at this time. I didn't know nothing then. I don't know, but very little now, uh, and he was in there preaching. Here's his exact words. He said, if you're not an expository preacher, you are not called of God to preach. Man, Brother Chris, I want to crawl under the pew. That morning I'm thinking, what was that word again? He's saying some word. I don't even know what he's talking about. I'm serious. Y'all think I'm lying, but I'm not. I don't have no schooling. Amen. I'm like, what is he talking about? Because I don't know if I got that or not. I don't remember God mentioning that to me when he called me to preach. Amen. He called me to preach the gospel. But he literally said it. If you're not expository, if you can't preach expository, you are not called a preacher. I wanted to crawl under the pew. I wanted to leave the meeting at that time because I didn't think I was one of them. I didn't know what, I had no idea what he was saying. Now, when I left, I'm, I like word study. I did go look it up. Amen. Expository preaching, and I'm not against it. I want you to know I'm not against it. Amen. Expository preaching is when you have to have an introduction. You have to have uh, uh, three points that rhyme and a conclusion at the end. That's what it is. And everything has to be lined up. I don't find that John's preaching. 
you bunch of grieving and no count, low down generation of vipers. I don't find anything expository in that. Amen. But yeah, I mean, he, he was serious about that thing too. And there's preachers in there going, Amen, brother, preach. I'm going, Whoa. I'm sitting amongst them rascals. I'm thinking, I don't know what he's up. But when I leave here, I'm going to find out what that word is. Because if it's something I need, I need to buy it or find it or something. I still ain't found it. I found the word. I know what it means. And every now and then, I try my best to do that, but I sure a whole lot rather just relate the word of God. But they were serious about that. But you can't do that. And, and listen, some of you know me well or, no, or know the system well enough. You know that if you cannot preach expository message, there are places you will never preach. They will never let you in. You have to send them your message ahead of time. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you got to send them that message ahead of time. Amen? And they'll screen it and tell you whether you're going to preach or not. I'm thinking, well, I, I ring a, they don't need to ask God. I just need to ask you. Listen, it happened. It happened. All over the place. There's, there's a preacher who's come to our church years ago. I, I dare not call his name. It's been many years ago. 99% of you won't know him. Amen? You won't re remember him now. But every time he, and I love this guy. I love this guy. I still love him. But every time he came, I knew exactly what he was going to do. I knew the introduction. I, I, I knew the, the, the three or four points he was going to make. I knew the conclusion. I knew every bit of it ahead of time. And I could sit back and just time him. It was on a 30, 35-minute clock. Everything was. And after a while, I just couldn't take it anymore. And need to say, I've not invited him back to revival for many, many years. I've seen a buddy of mine not long after that. He's in another county. He come to him today. He said, didn't so-and-so used to come to y'all's church and preach all the time? I said, he did. I said, man, I love that guy. He said, I love him too, but I sure wish he would get some different messages. <laughs> I wish he would get something a little. He said, man, I, I love him, but it's just like the same old, same old, same old. Listen, we need something fresh. John didn't come preaching expository. He didn't come preaching deliverance. He didn't come healing. He didn't come singing his way in. The Bible says in verse number 3, the one crying in the wilderness. John came crying. You know what I'm not finding anymore, Brother Cruz? Those that are just weeping for the concerns of God. Those that are just weeping over the law. Weeping over the church and church thousands of church doors every year are closing their doors and boarding up the windows and walking away. They cannot pay the bills. Listen, when, when are we going to start being like John? The Bible said that John came crying in the wilderness. Listen, he was very voiceful, but somewhere down in him there was a cry for an almighty God. That God's coming. The Lord's coming. John Cry like none other. I began to look at this the other day. Listen, I, boy, I'm convicted within myself so many times. I'm thinking, God, where's my tears at for the church? We get comfortable. I think, man, we got a great crowd and we got a great thing going on and we got great singing going on. I got some cold chills right here. I want to see somebody saved. I want to see somebody raised up for the glory of God. I want to see some young person called to the mission field. I want to see a young man called to preach. I want God to do something extravagant in the church. I want to see more. It's going to take a cry from the pastors. It's going to take a cry from the people to see God raise up a ministry and raise up a work and save people. And you see people weeping for God and crying out for God and doing the work of God. John wasn't one of these men that, uh, that came with uh, co committed words of, of memory. As one, uh, one writer put it, you know, listen, it's so easy this day and time, and I'm very careful with this. And uh, Matter of fact, if you're not careful, I, I love preaching. I, I really do, but I used to go and do um, chapel at the school. Dana, remember this. And when I'd go, go do chapel at the school, I'd have the young kids one meeting and the older and other, and I always do, did two separate messages all the time. I didn't just repeat the same message. And I had the teacher over there, I asked him a couple times, they said, how do, you, how do you do that? I said, they're not the same kids. They need something fresh. I mean, we need something fresh when we come in here. Amen? 
but let's preach it, and I'm not against this. I, but chances are when I go out to Texas, I'm going to probably preach a couple of messages I preached in here before. But, but I, I don't have a whole lot committed to memory. <laughs> don't y'all dare say it. I see two staring me down and say, that's a reason for that. I mean, if you don't have a lot of room up there, you can't commit a whole lot up there. Amen. Listen, John didn't come with a committed thoughts or, or memory thoughts that he had uh, living down inside. God, John came with a living truth that was blazing from his soul and dripping from his tongue like coals of fire. There was something blazing down inside of John when he came presenting the gospel. It's Friday morning, I was talking to my two buddies there at the gym. And uh, it was raining, and uh, Terry asked me, he said, Preach, he said, you going home and work on your message today? And I said, I am. I sure am. That's a good day to be in the office. Me and God is pouring down rain. Amen. And uh, I'm going home and finish up my message today. Reed looks at me, and he said, Mike, he said, make sure you go over it 12 times. He said, read it 12 times. Reed's about 85, 86 years old, and I respect him very highly. He said, go over and read it 12 times. He said, our pastor years ago said that he never preached a message unless he went over it 12 times. <laughs> Stairs said, I can tell with most of his message, he didn't go over it the first time. <laughs> he said, what comes out of his mouth sometimes, and trust me, he watches our messages. He watches our YouTube. He said, what comes out of his mouth sometimes, he did not think about it and look at it that second time. Now, my wife told me that, too. <laughs> did you think about what you said? I did not laugh after I said it. Any of y'all ever been that way? Yeah. Not laugh after I said it. Too late. I mean, Terry, Terry said, he, he, trust me, he didn't read over it two times, much less 12 times. He had no idea that was coming out of his mouth. I said, listen, when God shows up, God shows up. Just give him truth. John believed in just preaching the truth of God. It dripped out of John. It dripped off of his tongue as coals of fire. He preached the gospel. Let me tell you what he preached. He preached rebuke. I said a while ago, he said, you generation of vipers. He preached rebuke. Now, here we are today. Here we are today. For all you hurting children in here today, we want to try to help you. That wasn't John. By the way, that's not rebuke. Amen. Rebuke is when you tell somebody they're wrong. Woo. Lynette's in here today. One of my greatest hacklers. I love her. One of my most special members we have in this church. And she ain't going to mind me telling me this. Mind me telling this. A couple of weeks ago, she sent me a video. Text me a video. And this coach was standing out there at the ball field. He had all these little kids buzzed in. Looked like they were about five, six years old. And that coach was talking about, listen, we came here to win. We came here to win. We came here to win. You come across that line. We're going to win this ball game. We came here to win. And he said, if your daddy, if your daddy is one of them that said that everybody's a winner, he said, your daddy is a loser. <laughs> she takes that video right up under and said this. That was you, wasn't it? She said, I, when I saw that, I knew that was you. I said, yes, it was. That was me. Amen. Listen, rebuke is when we have to tell somebody that they are wrong. Whoa. John preached it. He not only preached rebuke, he preached warning. He said, who's warning you to flee the wrath to come? Don't you, don't you understand that there is a wrath to come? There's something coming your way. There, there's a wrath to come. Hey, who warned you to get away? He, he preached warning. Here's our warning today. Now, just remember Jesus loves you. Wow. What a warning. Amen. Just remember Jesus loves you. That is truth. It's just not all truth. And it's not a good story and warning. Get out of there. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Run from it. It's sin. It's going to kill you. It's going to take you to an early grave. It's going to leave sin scars on your body. Get out of there and leave it alone. Ooh. Mm. 
That don't go over well even in the Baptist church anymore. And by the way, Brother Porterfield may be watching this message out in Texas. He looks at some of our messages from time to time. That's okay with me. I didn't ask him what kind of church he had when he called me to come preach. He just called me to come preach. Hallelujah. Amen. He preached rebuke. John preached this in, in very earnest. Here's what he said. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, you want to be baptized? Show me you want to be baptized. We're taking these kids down to the children's home this year in July. And I don't know how many is going to go yet. They're still just praying about it. I've, I've, I've asked them not to give me an answer yet, not until they pray. I don't, I don't want an answer until they pray. Amen. You know what I want from them? Show me some meat you want to go. Show me you're real about it. Show me you want to go down there and work for God. Let's do something drastic for God. The first preacher in the New Testament church I find here came crying because of sin and corruption. The first preacher God mentioned. First preacher. He didn't come singing his way in. He didn't come delivering his way in. He didn't come healing his way in. He didn't come with some, you know, expository preaching that he had all these things. John, John's like himself, he didn't have it all laid out. He just came and prepared the way of the Lord. John's cry. Let me throw this in here real quick and I'll close. It's 12-11 right now. I thought about this. John's congregation. Now listen to this well. John's congregation. I appreciate our congregation. I would hate to think I had to preach to empty pews every week. I would. And I appreciate the congregation. Let me, let me, the, the Bible says here about John in verse number 5, it says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Can I tell you, let me just say this. Number one, they didn't go see a fine church. Why? Well, John's in the wilderness. But they all wanted to hear him preach. Amen. He was preaching about the Lord. He was preparing the way. Hey, li listen, to today, today, li listen, in the modern day age we live in, man, if you ain't got padded pews and, uh, and you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't got the, uh, the right singing and you ain't got air conditioning to build, I ain't coming. Amen. I ain't going to sit in Yesterday, let me just go ahead and plug this in. I won't preach to you tonight. We're just going to show the video. Yesterday, Jane and I were going to Cam's race after the funeral. Yesterday, we were going down to Kenley. We got caught up in a traffic jam over there in Durham. Amen. They were having the big thing over there for the cane, for the hurricanes at the Wolfpack Stadium yesterday, which I don't care. You know, I, I'm not against that. I just want you to know. I ain't beating up people because of that. But... Uh, I had to take a 30-minute detour just to get around that traffic. I saw one person said that they waited in line for three hours to get to the stadium. Now, I'm glad I didn't get caught up in that line. I, I was about to turn and go on 40, and I looked down there. There was cars coming back up the on ramp. And I'm like, oh, I thought they'd done changed the traffic pattern or something. <laughs> I, I really did. And I was about to turn. I looked, and there was cars coming. I'm like, hold on, what, what? What's, what's going on? And, uh, of course, our kids worry about Jane and I a little bit right now, traveling off by ourselves. They, they don't think we can get home on our own. <laughs> I'm like, surely somebody's going to show her the way home. They may show me where to go, tell me where to go, but they're going to show her the way home. I mean, but they're coming back up the off-ramp, and I'm like, ho, ho, ho. And so I, I just, I, I took a detour. I cut off that thing real quick, went on down the road. Jane said, what I said, look, we to pull it up, find out what's going on. And we took about a 30-minute detour to get all ran out. But listen, they waited for three hours. Three hours on 40 to get to a hockey game. They loved it that much. How many of those same people you think wait three hours to get in a church building? Especially if it was in the wilderness. These people walk for days to get out there. They walk for hours to get out there. They didn't have a fine church building. They didn't have padded pews. They didn't have air conditioning. Listen, but they wanted to hear the gospel. I love a congregation that wants to hear the gospel. 
I love it when you got a hungry people. Amen. That's what will spark revival. When people get hungry for the gospel and they're willing to go and they're willing to do. He didn't have a fine church building. They wasn't going out there to see some fine church building. He didn't have a congregation that said, listen, if you don't furnish me this, I no. John came crying in the wilderness and the people wanted to hear him preach. Imagine that. Oh, would I have loved to live in that day. My goodness, you just go cry and tell people the truth all the time, and they flock in, you know, by the hundreds and by the thousands uh, to come hear you preach cause, just because they want the truth. They weren't looking for a fine church. Thank God for the congregation that will go wherever God is. <laughs> they surely wasn't looking to have a fine supper with him. Because according to what I read right here, John was eating grasshoppers. <laughs> How many of y'all want to show up for that one? Oh, no, preacher, uh, we're we, we going to have steak. I, I've been teased a little bit about our hot dog supper out here last Saturday night, the redneck banquet and potted meat, the Vienna sausage and, and pickled sausage and pickled eggs and spam. And all. They're like, what? I said that crowd of mine ate every bit of it. Amen. And loved it. Thank God for it. This crowd, this day and time, is like, if you ain't going to set us up at the steakhouse, house, preacher, if you ain't going to set us up, you know, if you ain't going to catch. They weren't looking for that. They didn't go for the fine church. They didn't go for the fine food. Uh, I, I, I like these preachers that say, <laughs> and I, I probably get in trouble a little bit right here. I, I don't mean to, and I, I don't mean this ugly, but I mean it. I like those preachers say, well, you know, if you come and go with us, you'll get to eat with me. <laughs> oh, I get to eat in the same room with you. Woo! Is that not a blessing? I mean, if I come and go with you, I get to eat in the same room with you. And that's really what you're telling me. Amen. Because I'm sure I'm not going to have a seat beside you. I'm going to get to eat in the same room with you. And I'm supposed to be just, whoo, blown away by that. Amen. Isn't that nice? We got to eat in the same room with them. Hallelujah. They didn't go looking for that. They didn't go to be seen or to be seen with somebody. <laughs> I'm just as tickled when I can take some poor beggar out to eat because we like the same food. We like Bojangles. Amen. Or a newcomer to the church, and I say, I said, Preacher, you mind eating with say, Sure. I don't mind. Here's what, <laughs> I probably ought not say this right here, but here's what most people think. Most people think Jay and I do not ever have time to eat with them because our church people take us out to eat all the time. We don't ever have time for them. I, I, and I'm, uh, listen, if y'all ask today, I'm not going out to eat with you, just so you know, just because you will. I bet I don't get asked twice a year, Jay and I, to go out to eat with church people in our congregation. Can I tell you why? We've never focused on that. That's not our focus. If I get to go out and eat with one of them, hallelujah, it is my pleasure to go eat with them. I mean, needless to say, they pay for it. <laughs> I figured I got to get something out of you, amen? But it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to go out and eat with them. It's not, it, I, I don't ever want to think that it's their pleasure because I, they got to go eat with me. It's my pleasure that I got to go with them. Amen? And regardless of who's paying the bill, it's, it's a pleasure to go and do those things. But listen, they, they, they weren't going for the fine food and, and all the fine fellowship and all that. And, and, and John said, hey, if you all come on over here and, uh, and come over here and join us, you know, I'm going to let you eat right here in the same camp with me. All right, John. No, John just looked. John said, listen, I ain't eating no grasshoppers anyway. If y'all want some, you can have some. I mean, throw them on the fire. Let's pop them up and eat them. I mean, uh, both of them going, that's all right, John. We're, we're, we're good. 
We bought some bread with us. We got some fish in the bag. We're going to be good. Amen. Listen, his congregation, they were looking for a fine church. They were looking for fine food. <laughs> they surely did not admire him personally or physically. Why? The man was just strung out with camel's hair. <laughs> they probably didn't want to be too close to him. Amen. He just strung out with camel's hair and all dressed up in that. And they're like, I'm not. That's, that's okay, John. You know what they were looking for? Let me tell you what they were looking for. They came because there was a man filled with the power of God. His congregation came because there was a man filled with the power of God. Not because I need to be beside John. Not, not, not because John is this, this guy that just, man, he, he's got his dress down to a, a T and he, he's, he's got steaks on the table and, and all this stuff. He's got this big fine church and, and everything. No, they came to hear a man that was filled with the power of God because he was called of God. A man that just cried out in the wilderness. Can I tell you what we need to find today? We need to find that place in God where we know we need to clean some things out of our life so God can move in. Blake, come get on the piano for a minute. So God can move in on our life. So God can move in on our church. It should never be about a person. It should never be about a pastor. It should never be about a song. It should never be about a singer. It ought to be about the power of the Word of God and nothing else. What's in our hearts today that we would have to clear the way for Jesus to move in? So I mean, Jesus just move in and fill us up. I mean, just fill us up. What's in our church today that we would need to move so that the Lord Jesus himself could move in and fill us up. Let's all stand on our feet today. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a few minutes. I don't know where you are today. I only know where I am.